I'm Bob Barchi, and I'm the president here at Rutgers. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you to a special evening with a remarkable actor and advocate, Gina Davis. Now, I'm on, not up here to introduce her. You'll hear a formal introduction. I don't get that honor. That one goes to someone else. But I just want to take this opportunity to personally salute you for the fantastic leadership that you have exhibited on behalf of women in media and to say how happy we are that you're here at Rutgers with us tonight. Now, Ms. Davis joins us tonight through the good graces of the Susan and Michael J. Angelides Lecture Series. It's a forum that recognizes two visionary and generous benefactors for our institution. Uh, it really is, it's a remarkable program. Uh, it's one that Susan and Michael have put together support through the Institute for Women's Leadership and it's enabled Rutgers to bring some of the foremost and most talented women in the world to our campus. The Angelides Lectures have helped to advance women's leadership, not just here in the Rutgers community, but way, way beyond the walls of our institution. And I have to say we are so grateful uh, for their generosity, but even more so for the power of their vision and the vision that stands behind this and what it means. It, it's so important to an institution to have people who share our goals and share our mission and share our vision. And that's what these folks have been willing to do. So Susan and Michael, you're here, and maybe I could get you just to stand up for a minute and, and be recognized by the... <clears throat> So as I mentioned, the Angelides Lectures are sponsored by the Institute for Women's Leadership. Um, it's one of the most influential centers of its kind in the nation. And the Institute and all the centers, it's an umbrella organization, and all the centers that are underneath it comprise one of the great strengths that makes Rutgers an outstanding institution. You know, you probe around the corners of this institution and you find all these remarkable little treasures. This is a big treasure and it reaches into every part of our organization. I have to tell you that uh, my wife Frances is now a fellow of that institute uh, as she comes to join the faculty and she has been bringing home all these names and then I've had a chance to meet them and what I've found is that this is an incredible group of very, very powerful women um, who understand where they are in the world, they understand where they want to go and they understand how to get there and their mission is to help leadership in women in all the rest of our organizations accomplish the same things. Very, very impressive, um, especially to a man. So I must <laughs> say, I am really impressed. <laughs> Having said that, it really is a pleasure for me to turn the mic over to my distinguished colleague, Alison Bernstein, who runs the IWL, and I'm going to ask her to formally introduce our lecturer. And let me just tell you one or two brief sentences about Allison. She's a graduate of Vassar in Columbia. She's the author of three books, formerly the um, Associate Dean of Faculty at Princeton. Um, but more importantly, from my perspective, she was for 14 years a Vice President of the Ford Foundation, where she ran the program on knowledge, creativity, and free expression. So she has not only talked the talk, but walked the walk on this one, really understands where we're coming from. Most importantly, since July of 2011, she's served with distinction as the director of the Institute for Women's Leadership. So I give you Alison Bernstein. Good evening, and thank you so much, President Barchi, for that warm and generous introduction. On behalf of the Institute for Women's Leadership Consortium, let me publicly welcome both you, Bob Barchi, and Dr. Francis Barchi to one of IWL's most highly anticipated annual events, the Susan and Michael J. Angelides Lecture. And let me join President Barchi in thanking Susan and Michael for their sustaining commitment for the work of the IWL. Thank you very much. Like President Barchi, Like President Barchi, I take enormous pride in the work of the Institute and its nine member centers. There is nothing quite like us in American higher education. We are known nationally, 
and internationally for our depth of faculty expertise and staff experience in advancing women's leadership in a range of fields, including politics, the workforce, the arts, the sciences, as well as scholarship focused on women's and gender studies. Tonight, Susan and Michael J. Angelides' lecture will be delivered by the award-winning actor and women's equity advocate, Gina Davis. Like the IWL, Miss Davis is in a league of her own. <laughs> and for those of you a little young, the film, A League of Their Own, is now celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. I venture to say that this film about the struggles and triumphs of women baseball players, which is based on a true historical era, ha had one of Gina's most memorable performances. My 25-year-old twin daughters still revere her character, the great, the gorgeous catcher, Dottie Hinson. I am sure all of us have our favorite Gina Davis performance. Students in the IWL's Leadership Scholars Program mentioned Stuart Little with enthusiasm. <laughs> Mrs. Little? You don't look Mrs. Little. <laughs> Their mothers probably remember Thelma and Louise as a game-changing film. There you go. as a game-changing film about two independent women who chose their own destinies. We could talk tonight for the remainder of the evening about Davis's outstanding work as an actor both in film and on television when she portrayed the first ever woman president in a primetime series, Commander in Chief. But that's not the topic of this evening. Thanks to the Angelides' generous gift, Ms. Davis is here tonight to talk about a topic which the IWL, in collaboration with Rutgers' School of Communication and Information, has identified as an important and sadly overlooked arena of research and advocacy, namely women and media. Few in this chapel know that Gina Davis has been a major figure advocating for more women leaders in media fields, including as actors, but also as broadcasters, as owners, as studio heads, as writers, as directors, and as producers. Davis is also concerned about how the media, especially Hollywood, represents women and girls in feature films, in TV shows, and even cartoons. To examine this issue of women in media, Davis founded in 2006 a new nonprofit institution called the Gina Davis Institute on Women in Media. And I am thrilled to report that the IWL is now partnering with the Davis Institute on our new Women and Media Initiative. One of our first joint projects with the Davis Institute is a fact sheet which is enclosed in your program. I hope you all look inside your program not while Gina is speaking, but afterwards. And let me just say that beyond that, Gina has agreed to serve on the Women and Media Initiative's Emerging National Advisory Board. So this lecture is not the last time we will have to learn from Gina Davis, from her work and her commitment to advancing women leaders in media. Gina is a New Englander by birth, and I believe this is Gina's first visit to Rutgers. So please, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gina Davis to New Jersey's premier great public research university. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Barchi, and uh, I adore you, Alison Bernstein, the director of IWL. I'm sure you're all thrilled to have her here with you. Um, and Michael and Susan Angelides, thank you so much for your generosity, uh, uh, because now I get to be here. So thank you very much. Um, and gosh, thank you for that insane reception. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. You know, <clears throat> 
it's always a little weird for me to stand in front of people and, and speak. It's not my usual day job. And, and I always feel like, well, maybe people have an idea of what I'm like uh, because of, you know, parts I've played or whatever. Um, but to me, you know, I'm not any different. I'm just the same dorky kid that I always was <laughs> growing up. Uh, it's funny. I was just talking about that with the limo driver in the motorcade on the way over. Um, <laughs> just the same, but then I was in a motorcade. Okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so, <laughs> so I am here. Maybe it's because it's a church and you feel like, you know, I shouldn't get too rowdy. Um, I am here today because I share a very, very similar passion with the Institute on Women's Leadership, which is to support and encourage and advocate for women and girls to reach their full potential as leaders. I have spent most of my adult life advocating for women and girls, um, among other things, by seeking roles that I thought might be constructive for women in some way. Uh, it's true, I made a film called Earth Girls Are Easy. <laughs> But this was very early on. I think we could just put that aside for now. Um, so evidently, I announced that I wanted to be an actor when I was age three. This is what my parents tell me. I've, I'll digress just a second to explain while I call myself uh, an actor instead of actress. The dictionary definition of actor is a person who acts. It's not a man who acts. So, I kind of feel like we don't really need a little wee on the end of the word to uh, connote femaleness. In fact, um, I think soon actress is going to sound as quaint and old fashioned as authoress and poetess, right? And doctoress. So uh, uh, I consider myself uh, a former waiter who became an actor. Um, so back to three years old, I, I can't imagine what it was I saw that convinced me to go into acting, but my goal never wavered, and when it came time to go to college, I uh, decided to major in acting at Boston University. Majoring in acting, this is a very good idea, because it always works out, right? <laughs> my whole family, we were so removed from anything to do with show business that when I told my parents, you know, I'm I think I'm gonna major in acting, uh, they were like, oh, okay. As if I'd said, you know, dentistry or, or something. Uh, uh, something where you could get a job after you graduate. Um, but whatever the odds, I had this, this you know, unshakable faith that I was going to succeed, that I was going to be an actor. Here's a, a, a little embarrassing story that illustrates what I mean. Um, so the very first class at BU, was an orientation for the incoming freshmen. There's about 100 kids coming in. And the professor's uh, talking to us and says, you know, I have to tell you, you've chosen an incredibly difficult profession. In fact, probably only 1% of you will ever be able to earn your living as an actor. And I thought, these poor kids. <laughs> So, maybe I should amend what I said a minute ago. I either had this unshakable faith or I was too dense to understand uh, simple percentages. Um, after graduation, I have no idea how I'm supposed to now get a job in acting. I mean, shouldn't they tell the one person who's going to succeed how to find a job? Uh, but uh, as it turned out, my very first job was in Tootsie. It was in the movie Tootsie. I had a small part. It was partly because I was in a Victoria's Secret catalog, but that's kind of a long story. Um, but how insanely fortunate was that, that my very first movie is with Dustin Hoffman and Sidney Pollack as the director, and um, I was home one time and overheard my mom and a neighbor talking, and the neighbor saying, my God, we can't believe it, nobody can believe it, it's so amazing. And uh, my mom said, well, she studied acting in college. <laughs> So she never really had to learn about the odds and everything. Um, I thought this evening I would share with you a few stories uh, that were experiences that led me down new paths, paths that were not part of my original master plan uh, to become an actor. When I got cast in A League of Their Own, I had to play the best 
baseball player anybody had ever seen, a real phenomenon, right? The problem being that I didn't know how to play baseball or any other sport, really. Um, in high school, everybody has something that tortures them, right? And mine was being the tallest uh, kid in class. Uh, my fondest wish was to take up less space in the world. I was very gangly and awkward and, and tall, and uh, I was convinced that I was uncoordinated. I didn't want to try anything physical. The girls' basketball team was constantly begging me, you know, to be on the team. I said, I can't play. And they said, just stand there. <laughs> But I trained in baseball, uh, of course, for the movie, and, and the coaches soon started saying, you know, you have some untapped athletic ability, which was a huge compliment for someone who grew up uh, tripping over her own feet. So after that, it turned out I had to learn uh, a few other sports for other movies that I was in, like uh, taekwondo and fencing and horseback riding and ice skating. And uh, it was no wonder to me that I was attracted to these roles that had a physical component because it turned out it was like a rebirth. Uh, I uh, uh, found out that I was actually coordinated. It just took until I was 36 to find out. <laughs> and it made me feel finally like it was okay to take up space in the world and to inhabit my body because it could actually do things. Um, what I learned from this experience about uh, self-esteem and body esteem led me to get involved with the Women's Sports Foundation, uh, which is a wonderful organization that tries to get more women and girls involved in playing sports because I wanted girls to learn all the benefits of sports that I did, but when they were actually still kids. Um, the movie, this, that experience also helped spur me on to a personal athletic goal. Um, I decided that I wanted to learn a sport the real way, not the like movie version, a, a, a sport where you actually had to score points. Because as good as I ever got at playing baseball, any uh, homer that my character hit was flung over the fence with this giant slingshot. Um, <laughs> and we were, we were rarely actually able to use uh, hard balls. The crew was against it for some reason, um, <laughs> in their direction, they didn't like that. Um, so if you ever happened to hear that I took up archery at age 41 and thought, random, uh, now you know that was the, the sport that I chose. So I totally immersed myself and after tremendous hard work and uh, practice, two and a half years later I qualified uh, for the Olympic trials. And uh, uh, what can I say, I, I, everything I do I take too far, in fact, uh, <laughs> I have to really watch what I get involved in because eventually I will want to go to the Olympics in it. <laughs> the film that really had the most impact on my life was Thelma and Louise, uh, which really in effect changed the course of my life. Um, it cemented my passion to help empower women and it's driven my commitment ever since. Uh, of course, first I had to get cast in the movie. See, um, a friend slipped me the script, but by that time, uh, they'd already cast two women as Thelma and Louise. But that all fell through a few months later, but they immediately hired a different director and another pair of women. And then it happened a third time. So there were three sets of Thelma's and Louise's cast before Susan Sarandon and I were there. Um, my, uh, so during all this time, it's about a year, my agent called Ridley Scott every week to say, Gene is still interested, Gene is still interested. Um, he was just gonna produce the movie at that time. He wasn't gonna direct it, but he finally decided he was gonna direct it. And finally, I get an opportunity to meet with him. So now I have like a year's worth of passion and ideas and thoughts about this movie and what it means and you know, how deeply affected I am by it and why I absolutely had to play Louise. And um, he's listening, you know, and uh, uh, he says, so in other words, you wouldn't play Thelma. <laughs> There's just a brief, brief pause before I say, you know what, as I've been talking, I've been listening to myself, and you know what I think? I think actually I should be playing Thelma. 
and here's why. And then I just vamped another 20 minutes about why I absolutely had to play uh, Thelma. Uh, it was a rare case where, I never heard of this before, but I got, I signed a contract that said I would agree to play either part, depending on who the other person was. Um, what I didn't know about Thelma and Louise was how dramatically it would impact me. Everyone working on the movie knew this is a very good script, it's unusual in that it has two really well-rounded female characters, but there was nothing else about it that uh, particularly stood out to us. Um, nothing that was, uh, would give us an indication that we were making something significant. Um, you know, it was, uh, like I said, it was unusual it had two female uh, lead characters, but, and maybe people you know, would have some thoughts about that we drive off the cliff at the, well now I give the ending away. So. <laughs> So before the movie came out, if people recognized me on the street or whatever, they might say something like, oh, the fly, or oh, I saw you in Beetlejuice. This was during my bug phase. Um, but after the movie came out, immediately after the movie came out, it was completely different. I had like, you know, people stopping me in the street and you know, holding onto my clothes while they told me what the movie meant to them, and oh my god, it, it impacted us, and, and my friend and I acted out your trip. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, this had never happened before, um, and it really brought home to me in a very powerful way how few opportunities we give women to feel like that about the female characters in a movie, to come out of a movie feeling empowered and excited about characters that kill themselves even. But, it, you know, it really struck a nerve. Um, so ever since then, I make choices about what roles I want to play based on thinking about the women in the audience. What are they going to feel about my character? Not that I want to play role models, mind you. I mean, if, uh, Thumb and Louise, if you think about it, we like uh, kill a guy, drive drunk, evade the law, hold up a liquor store, have sex with a stranger, and kill ourselves. So. That whole we, we acted out your trip thing, I'm just not. <laughs> I don't quite get that. But here's the thing. I'm only able to be picky about parts because, frankly, I haven't run out of money yet. Uh, <laughs> seriously, the great parts for women are so few and far between that you really can't afford to, you know, wait for something good to come along um, unless you can afford it. So if you ever read that I've signed on to play, you know, Sean Connery's kidnapped wife. Uh, I think that's about the right Hollywood age difference. Um, uh, you'll know I'm broke. So, cut to about eight years ago. I founded uh, my research institute on gender and media because, media because I wanted the data on one very specific thing. How many female characters were there in entertainments that are made for little kids? Uh, because at that time, my daughter, uh, Alizé, was two years old, she's 10 now, and with this spidey sense that I had about women's roles in media, uh, I started watching things with her and I immediately saw that there seemed to be far fewer female characters than male characters, and a great deal of stereotyping in these uh, TV shows and movies that are made for kids. Um, I didn't really intend to let the subject take over my life at that time. Uh, at first, I just started mentioning it to friends casually. I said, did you realize in that movie that just came out, there was only one female character in the whole movie, except for the, you know, the mother that dies in the beginning? And, uh, and no one, ever said that they had noticed that. So then I started mentioning it, if I had meetings in, uh, in my industry, you know, with a producer or studio executive, I'd say, have you ever noticed how few female characters there are in uh, G-rated movies? And to a person, they would say, no, 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 that's been fixed. And uh, very often they would then say, there's been Belle, the character in Beauty and the Beast, who, uh, <laughs> gets Stockholm Syndrome, and, um, <laughs> and evidently it solved everything. So uh, 
So it occurred to me as a mother that kids should be seeing boys and girls sharing the sandbox equally from the beginning. Um, but I realized I needed the numbers because nobody was realizing it and my pointing it out wasn't having any impact. So this took my life in an entirely new direction as a data head. Um, research has become extremely significant in my life. My institute has commissioned the largest amount of research ever done on gender depictions uh, in media, in film and television, covering a 20-year span. And uh, the results were stunning. It was conducted at USC's Annenberg School for Communication by Dr. Stacy Smith. And it showed that the worldview that our culture is reflecting to children is very unbalanced. Uh, in G and PG rated films, for every one female character, there are three male characters. And of the female characters that did exist, the majority were highly stereotyped and or hypersexualized with, get this, the female characters in G-rated animated movies wear the same amount of sexually revealing clothing as the female characters in R-rated movies. And in animated films, because they can draw them any way they want, the female characters so very often have uh, a waist so small that you have to wonder, would a spinal column even fit in there? <laughs> Um, and one of the most common occupations for G-rated female characters was uh, royalty, which is a nice gig, if you can get it. <laughs> Our research also showed that uh, females were missing from critical occupational sectors. We just recently uh, completed a comprehensive study that looked at female occupations and careers uh, of characters in uh, popular films from 2006 to 2009 and not one female speaking character was depicted as a powerful American political figure across nearly 6,000 speaking characters in family films. We found that uh, in family films also, males hold 81% of the jobs and 84% of all STEM jobs. No female protagonists or co-leads were shown with STEM careers. And looking at specifically uh, science and uh, computer science and engineering, the ratio of males to females was 15 to 1. So our research also showed that in G-rated films, there was not one female depicted in the field of medical science, as a business leader, in the law profession, or in politics. There were characters in those fields, but all of them were male. Also, all of the criminals were male, but um, I'm not going to fight for parity in that Area. I'm willing to just let that go. So you may be thinking, oh my god, what the heck? These, these numbers are horrifying. Uh, I don't want you to think that it's all bad news, okay? Because uh, we were able to find that um, we could measure an increase in the percentage of female characters over this 20-year span. It was 0.7%, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> meaning by my uh, reckoning, that we will achieve parity in uh, 700 years. <laughs> so, what message are we sending to boys and girls at a very impressionable age if the female characters are one-dimensional, sidelined, stereotyped, highly sexualized, or simply not even there at all? We are saying that women and girls don't take up half the space in the world. We are telling them that women and girls are less valuable to our society than men and boys. And the message is sinking in. The more hours of TV a girl watches, the fewer options she thinks she has in life. And the more boys watch, the more sexist their views become. So by feeding our youngest kids a seriously imbalanced world from the very beginning, we are in effect training yet another generation not to notice this gender disparity. And it happened to all of us, it doesn't matter when you were born, the ratio of male to female characters in films was exactly the same as it is now. Uh, it's been the same since 1946. The fact is, and before that it was better, so uh, you, can't, uh, you can't say things are improving. Um, 
The fact is that women are seriously underrepresented across nearly all sectors of society, but for the most part, we're not aware of the full extent of it. Um, the White House Project is a nonprofit that I'm on the board of, uh, and they advocate for more women to run for office and to be leaders in business. And uh, a couple of years ago, they released what they called a benchmark report, where they looked at 10 sectors of society to figure out the percentage of women in leadership positions in these 10 sectors. So it was like business, law, politics, media, academia, et cetera. And uh, so across these 10 sectors, the average percentage of women in leadership positions was 17%. Across all the 10 major sectors of society, 17%. How is that possible? That things would stall out at 17%. But that percentage is actually all around us, if you look. 17% of the US Senate is uh, women. House of Representatives, 16.8%. Only 17% of movie narrators are women. Women represent 16.1% of uh, board seats in Fortune 500 companies. Women make up 17% of cardiac surgeons. Uh, that's also the percentage of women in the Animators Guild. My body fat is 17%. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's kind of everywhere. Uh, so why would this percentage, uh, this uh, leadership uh, gap stop at 16, uh, 17%? I'll tell you another um, uh, a fact that, uh, of research that I know. In movies, 17% of the crowd scenes are female. Only 17%. It seems like you would have to, have to actually go out of your way to leave out that many uh, female characters. Um, I have a theory about that, that, uh, that this possible. I don't know if this is true, it's just a theory, but that Hollywood writers think that women don't gather, that <laughs> Let's, let's say there's a scene in a, you know, a village or a church or whatever, and uh, uh, somebody says, oh, something's happening over there. What is that? Let's all go see. And the women say, mm, I'm, not, I'm not really into gathering. I, don't know. I have other stuff to do. <laughs> but we were all raised on uh, shows and movies that had very few female characters and very few that we would want to emulate or grow up to be. Um, when I was a kid, my best friend Lucianne and I, uh, after school, would play in her backyard at being cowboy heroes from, from westerns. And uh, because I was taller, I would usually be the father and uh, she would be my son. Um, <laughs> and because we were young, we never realized that there weren't any female characters that we wanted to pretend to be. Um, there were some lead female characters on television, um, like uh, I Dream of Jeannie and Bewitched, right? They were lead characters and had cool superpowers. But if you, uh, if you think about, if you look back, every episode seemed to be about the men wanting them to sit on their special abilities, right? This happened in several of my marriages. <laughs> so, the fact is gender inequalities remain deeply entrenched everywhere you look, and we know that change doesn't happen easily. In fact, in many areas of progress for women, uh, things have stalled or actually started moving backwards. So, what can we do about this? We know what the Institute of Women's Leadership is doing about it. Through their work, they are empowering girls and women to reach their potential to become leaders. And I met many of them today, and uh, they are an inspiring group of women. Uh, I, I was nothing like them when I was their age. I'm nothing like them now, in <laughs> fact. Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> like Bill and Melinda Gates, I like to consider myself an impatient optimist, and I bet a lot of you are that way too. The time for change is now, and there are powerful agents of change here in the room today that I wanted to introduce to you. All of you, all of us, are powerful agents of change. 
and along with the Women's uh, Leadership Institute, we are going to embrace what Dr. Martin Luther King called the fierce urgency of now. <clears throat> what we need across all the sectors of society is to add women. We need more women on screen and behind the cameras. We need more women in the realms of academia and business and law and the military. We must add women from the people reporting the news to the people making the news, add women. To the ranks of corporate boards, policy makers, prime ministers and presidents, add women, encourage women, include women, vote for women, hire women. I am so happy to be here with all of you tonight. This is a very special evening for me, and uh, I'm so thrilled to be able to help promote the Institute of Women's Leadership and their work in uh, empowering women and girls. I want the day to come soon when I can share this story with my daughter. I can say, you know, once upon a time, women and girls were considered to be less important in the world than men and boys. And she would turn to me with an incredulous look and then say, Mom, are you making this up? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>